So we have four speakers talking about different, about health, about uh, um, um, rural development, financial inclusion, and so on. So we'll just go through this. And good policies come from a good heart. Properly executed, political to begin with, but a brief window translated by a team which could have bureaucracy and the civil uh, service. Normally it's a leap in the dark, a leap of faith, and sometimes it lands properly. Of course, a lot of contributors are now very much in. And there is a lot of continuity in policy. So much so you can't blame anybody for failures. If you take India's policy, I can trace a continuity from the 1950s. And it's incremental, evolutionary. Often, you'll find policies practice. And so that is a to start with. Yes, beyond the binary is very true. Very few grand successes or abject failures in public policy, because you just don't jump into a policy. Of course, we have the project bias, which was popularized by Robert Chambers more than four decades ago. We all go and study successes. But successes need to be studied for motivating replication. You don't go in, but failures for improvement. So that thing is very, very important. And failures and successes often we miss. I can give you one example. Swachh Bharat. We need to study to go to the next steps. And some are average. And they need to continue, like ICDS and all that. But now, even a rights-based policy, a lot of activists want a rights-based policy. They need not succeed. And right to education is a classic example. Then this big dilemma, is it policy failure or implementation failure? I think they are closely related to separate. Now, I will dwell on this policy of Rarban or Pura, just to give a background. I think when I explain it, there's no time to explain. That would be seen as the solution to India's problems of urban areas and India's problems of rural areas. Brilliantly conceptualized by no lesser person than Dr. Abdul Kalam, along with process integration of Chennai IIT. Indian villages lie scattered. They don't have the scale to succeed economically or even in human development. You just link the villages in an elliptical or a circular kind of thing, as Abdul Kalam called it, circular connectivity, so that a population of 2,500 suddenly becomes 25,000, 225,000 become 50,000, and you have an urban area, urban characteristics in a rural area. Very simple, solid concept. But how we messed it up, including me, that is what I'll tell you. So connecting villages, physical connectivity, electronic connectivity, which post-COVID is probably the most important connectivity, then your knowledge connectivity, education, and financial connectivity, banking, all this together organically contribute to what he called economic connectivity, so that it grows, there's a local economic development. But we didn't succeed because it requires, we are trying to create a threshold population for services and all that. So, you need to go from silos, we are all used to silos, water supply here, hospital there, school there, to a kind of integrated whole, purpose, purposefully per conversed. Not just conversed, organically integrated. That's a big point I want to make. You can converge, but organically integrating, sequencing, and catalyzing this evolution of multi-linked projects is a big problem in government, in all kinds of schemes. So we will not blame anybody. And it was launched in 2004, relaunched in 2014. And why it failed? So I will call you the deep roots of failure. One, excellent theory, but no viable proof of concept. So now, okay, looking back, 10 years, if we had developed, it will not develop suddenly. That's a problem. In politics, we are in a hurry. To develop this will take about five, six years, 
even a basic proof of concept. So we jumped into it in 2004, again in 2014. Then political signals are weak. Um, these are very critical for policy. They are there for a few days. But unless they are sustained at least for five, six months, they will not, they will not succeed. Then funding. It's a poorly funded scheme. A ministry which has one lakh crore gives them 300, 400 crores, or even 500. You need big funding. Maybe it goes down the drain in the beginning, but is required. Then real understanding, buy-in, ownership, which can come only through communication. A lot of communication, discussion, dialogue, what it is to convey it not only to the top state bureaucracy, but down to the cutting edge level. It can be done. So no, I'm not. Then the pull factor from beneficiaries, activists, industry. Yes, we need it. These were missing. These I call the deep roots. The middle roots, as I said, failure to understand the principles, so we all go in. But many of the, if you go to the Pura area now, or the urban area, people will be very happy. We got a water supply here, we got a road there, we got a well here. But the economic connectivity didn't happen. So it's not that it's a waste of money. Good quality schemes have come up, but they have not added up. That is a kind of thing. Then a simple thing, there is a great lack of capacity in spatial planning in rural areas. We think spatial planning is for ba Bangalore urban. That's a big mistake. Even in a state like Kerala, where I come from Kerala, country planning is there, it's relatively weak. Then of course we have disembowered local governments, weak participation. The shallow routes, the immediate routes, no institution to run this. You can't, this can't be run by a department. But it can't be done by an artificial institution also. It's a big challenge in government. Do you create a project management unit? It will not. That will not be internalized by this. There are no solutions to some other reasons. Then, of course, we have a big spread thin, thin attitude among politicians, among bureaucracy. We'll ask something everywhere. Some hundred puras, you concentrate all your resources from NHM, uh, Sarva Siksha, uh, Samagra Siksha, Abhyan, PMGSY, and all that. If you concentrate in hundred, we can have the proof of concept, but we are not willing. So we'll have something of here and there. And then, of course, we get these days, we get project prepared by an external agency taken on tender. They have no organic links with governance. Then, of course, political selection of clusters. Another big thing is short project period, three years. You can't have this. You need 30 years for that. And, of course, PPP is quite weak. Implementation in silos, leadership, the usual kind of things. Then another big missing thing is concurrent evaluation. In the initial days, when I was very young, 40 years ago, we used to have concurrent evaluation of many flagship programs. So immediately you get this, this failing. Now we don't have, we, we have post facto evaluation. And the social accountability is very important these days. We are found missing in these kind of things. So how to measure, we don't know. So let me conclude. I said, these are the shallow roots middle roots and the deep roots, but they are all linked, naturally linked, biologically linked. So you can't just say the shallow roots and so this is to be taken down. So which means an understanding and communication with the state for knowledge, advocacy for, that is missing here, advocacy for attitudes. Most of government schemes require attitudes, all other things are here and there. So that is very important and learning to go, together by de doing. So that is very easily done. I did people's plan in Kerala, so I know what it is. It's very difficult to do, very difficult to do. You, know, you cannot recreate those circumstances. So for skills. So uh, we attribute anything to China, Chinese proverb. I don't know if it's Chinese, but I've heard. Crossing the river, feeling the stones. That is what we need to do in these kind of things. And nurture beacons as schools of pra practice, seeing is believing, and peer learning works better. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Vijayanand. Um, you said that uh, economic uh, uh, connectivity did not happen, uh, and I think that's a good way to move to Usha, who will talk about the economic connectivity. Uh, in fact, I remember once uh, one of your bu bureaucrat uh, colleagues uh, said that, uh, you know, uh, one of the dangers, you know, you talked about the pr proof of concept. He said one of the dangers of any government program is a pilot program succeeding. He said, then the program will fail. Because uh, you don't replicate the circumstances in which you do the uh, you know, pilot program where you give the best of talent, best of attention and so on. And when it replicates and you don't customize it. I mean, and public policies, that's why the toughest nut to crack 
because uh, you can't customize it too much because ultimately you're accountable uh, to the exchequer, you're accountable to the public at large. It, there is a design element which makes a public accountability difficult to customize uh, public policy programs. Usha, all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Selco Foundation. Thank you to Indian Institute of Management and personally to you, Sri Ram and Harish for inviting me here today. Great pleasure to be here and I seem to be more inclined to talk about philanthropy than about <laughs> financial regulation. But listening to Mr. Vijayanan, the, it uh, reminded me one big risk he didn't mention. Today I work with a very good district magistrate or a Zilla Parishad president and really work very hard and, um, and we're going very strong guns and then he's transferred. <laughs> and how many such examples I've had, experiences I've had. So I used to think when we were doing the lead bank scheme, Let's locate a good, very passionate lead bank officer, a good lead district officer from RBI, and a district commissioner, and I'm sure we'll, you know, achieve the skies. And it did happen, but short-lived. So it's something that we have to learn from. I don't know whether Sriram in the Committee on Financial Inclusion for the Northeastern region, when we were uh, looking at that Meghalaya example of uh, organic ginger and the uh, IAS officer there tried to deal with the mafia and create a market where the local people could get a market. It was a wonderful model. Again, I don't know where it went and how it went. So there is, I don't know whether <laughs> Ram will talk about it. But these are some things that today's uh, conference in the morning has really brought to my memory. And I felt it's such an amazing thing that uh, Selco is doing by organizing such a conference, which is a diverse subjects impact investing, social enterprise, philanthropy. I mean, it's, it's amazing, really. So, well, I have to talk about policy. So let me today, um, and in policy, and I, and I feel very privileged and humbled in a sense, because I have, you know, I always say 30 year, 38 years of career in the Reserve Bank, 19 years were before 1991, and 19 years were after 1991. And 1991 was a real uh, milestone when things completely changed after 1992. And I was there in the center of uh, excitement, right on this, you know, in the middle of all the foreign exchange uh, regulations, changes, uncharted territory, everything was new. It was like a startup. We didn't have any precedence to go by, we didn't have any experience of going over to a market-related system, everything was administered, everything was controlled, that was the license Raj days, and here you were getting into completely new territory. And so, and when you start really thinking of policy, you start thinking of policy objectives first, right? So when you have objectives, you have, like somebody said, efficiency, equity, integrity, you know, we can have so many things, but there are always trade-offs. A trade off between inflation and growth, trade off between stability and growth, trade off between efficiency and equity, trade off between growth and equity. So these trade offs are what one is constantly looking at while formulating policy. And at different points of time, different objectives get, gain precedence. And so other objectives, like today, inflation may be the most important thing, but growth is certainly very important. So that is how policy, you know, evolves, and it cannot be uh, constant. It is something that is dynamic and is evolving. There are also upside, and when you're formulating policy, you're always looking at downside risks. But then, if you become a risk-averse person, then there's no good. Policy is not going to do any good because your objectives of policy are not going to get achieved. So upside, downside risks, known, unknown risks, unknown, unknown risks, and known, unknown risks, these are all the things one talks about. And I think that is why this is such an exciting canvas to have been in, and I really feel tremendous about that. So today I just thought I'll, uh, and definitely success or failure is not a binary, because even after policy outcomes, one can't say whether it was a success or not a success. And the benefit of hindsight, the counterfactual, very difficult to analyze. So contexts are different, situations are different, and therefore it's very difficult to analyze what would have happened if kind of a thing. 
These are the objectives of any financial regulator. Safety of public funds, obviously the first and foremost. Consumer protection, financial integrity, system stability, and financial inclusion. Today, I want to explore the policy success and failure, if one can call that, with respect to the regulation on the microfinance and the self-help groups. Now, I've just put up this list so you don't really have to look at it. I, I, would, I don't know how many in this room, and I'm told by Professor Sriram that quite a lot of people would be familiar with the microfinance story in India. It is fairly well known throughout the world wherever we have tried to promote financial inclusion. It is a policy which was evolved, um, say started sometime ar around the early 2000s, when it grew, the system grew. Initially, they were not-for-profit microfinance institutions, either registered as a trust or a society or a Section 8 uh, company. And later on, uh, for-profit, non-banking financial companies followed and took up microfinance. Foreign direct investment was allowed in these companies to the extent of 100%. So a good amount of foreign private equity entered this, and one can even say social enterprise equity, because they were all working for the poor. Uh, the <coughs> many policy developments that Reserve Bank did were to encourage the banks funding these microfinance institutions to be able to provide uh, the kind of doorstep services that the poor really needed. Because for a poor person to even enter a bank branch was something very forbidding. In fact, that's why ATMs were so popular, because there was nobody to you know, bar you or you, feel you don't feel welcome. So this was a very good way in which there could be financial inclusion. There was an earlier program of the self-help groups uh, linked with the banks, and that was a huge success program. But there was some, again, subsidy entered into that scheme. So the banks got disenchanted with the self-help groups, which were availing government subsidies. Only for, uh, they formed groups only to avail government subsidy. But that's a separate failure story. I'm not reciting that today. This network of self-help groups that were created was taken advantage of by the microfinance companies who take, could, uh, took advantage of network, particularly in Andhra Pradesh, where the World Bank had supported a huge project for the creation of self-help groups. So that network got very well taken advantage of by the microfinance companies. Well, I would say, I'm not saying it's a, it was a, not a good thing, because that really enabled them to further the lending in those areas. The entry of foreign private equity actually scaled up. Everybody was after scale. Valuations were growing because of the numbers that were coming in. So finally, it became a question of huge amount of scaling up, one of the companies going for an IPO, the obsession with valuation, the obsession with numbers, values, turned into predatory, coercive lending with terrible recovery practices, and um, till ultimately large-scale defaults came around. And when the microfinance companies went to force the very vulnerable borrowers to repay, the government of Andhra Pradesh put a stay on all repayments. And that industry collapsed. So what was the policy till then? The Reserve Bank policy was actually a very soft touch regulation. Deliberately, it was allowing the sector to grow so that it could, full, it could be nimble-footed, it could be flexible. It, it, the, ex, the supervision or the um, sort of, what shall we say, the objective of it was assume that the banks would exercise good risk management practices and achieve that. But I think that was not, that was a mistake of presumption. RBI really, not only did not bring in too much of regulation, but it also encouraged banks to lend to this because there was something called priority sector lending and this kind of lending was treated as priority sector and weaker session lending obligations that the banks had to fulfill. So we thought it was a good combination of banks and the informal sector, the non-banking sector, and the not-for-profit microfinance institutions to partner together to do this massive financial inclusion. 
But 2008, 9, 10 were terrible uh, period when this crisis just blew in our face. And um, till then we always thought, oh, global financial crisis is a systemic crisis. We never imagined that a microfinance crisis can be a systemic crisis. But it involved millions of people. It's a different thing when you say it's involving millions of crores. But when it's involving millions of people, then it's equally a systemic issue. And it became a problem for the Reserve Bank because the bank's, books, the bank's loan portfolio was affected. They, they could not recover the loans from the, in, the microfinance institutions. And so they had to, we had to give special dispensation for restructuring. And this was a series of experiences which led to a committee known as the Maligam Committee came up and it became extremely prescriptive regulation. The same thing that we had sought to avoid got thrown in our faces and the reaction, overreaction of maybe interest rate caps, end use control, uh, purposes for lending, ceiling on uh, amount of money, not for, product, not for consumption purpose, for livelihood, income generating, all the words that we had avoided, <laughs> they all came back into the regulatory sphere. Um, and that's where the current scenario is, where all microfinance is brought under this. But I think the, I'm not very sure how those prescriptive part of it regulations are being uh, enforced, but I think the important thing probably which is keeping the sector stable today, one is the shock treatment which the banks got at that point of time. And secondly, the prudential, that means the additional prudential prescriptions that Reza Bank put on the non-banking companies to maintain additional uh, you know, care, care. So uh, these are obviously the success. I've gone through that. <coughs> Numbers are huge, the microfinance sector. Number of loans, almost uh, seven, uh, I mean, what is it? Yeah, 367, about 700 uh, lakhs. So what is the lessons to be learned? Was it a mistake to have allowed easy entry of private equity capital? Somebody else here talked about, you know, the private equity. In a, in a sector where the clientele were vulnerable, was this the mistake? Was it a mistake to have allowed unbridled growth without trying to see what is lying behind those figures and that growth? What was the role of credit information and did we sufficiently exploit IT-enabled controls? Was it a mistake to have allowed IPO? Because then everybody is only after the quarterly profits and the stock market valuation. How do we enforce uh, consumer protection for this sector? Nobody is going to write a letter to the grievance authority. You need some sort of a low kadalat or you need somebody sitting in a village, you know, panchayat kind of thing and dispensing justice. How can we have an effective grievance redressal scheme? Is there a role for NGOs? Can an ombudsman scheme work at all? Was it not important to have had financial education and counseling along with microfinance? Most of the loans, and this is a very important question I'd like to ask this audience. Everybody who's been connected with the microfinance sector knows that the loans were taken largely for family events, milestone events, for medical emergencies, and for education. At least education, one can say it's a investment. Health also, I suppose, an investment. But there was, where were the money being earned to be able to repay this? Is it a failure for the government to have provided the basic education and health needs, you know, from the government so that you don't have to take loans for, you know, uh, getting those needs, which are very, very important. Has microfinance substituted government primary health and education services? And this is a question, I mean, not me, Rakesh Mohan, I know, had raised it from some time to time. And ultimately, can microfinance really be a poverty alleviation tool? It has to work along with real sector initiatives and with infrastructure of every kind. So these are my questions. I have answers to some of them, but I think you can be you know, allowed to ask them also. Thanks a lot. Can we get uh, Ram Kumar, please, uh, to talk about health sector? 
so we'll sort of try and put all these things together towards the end. Let's see how we can uh, get these diverse ideas. Yeah. So uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm very happy to be uh, uh, here to at a conference to talk about uh, failures, and I think that's a very can be a very honest uh, conversation. And happy to see many. Uh, familiar, unfamiliar faces because uh, during COVID we had discussed and spoke a lot on other mediums and not uh, in person. So I'm happy to see quite a few of them. Thank you, Mr. Harish, and thanks for the team to have here. Uh, I have had so much failures, frankly speaking, because my experience like other panelists has not been so uh, deep. I've been only 10 years into almost into government uh, business and etc. But uh, I see them quite often around either the past failures or present ongoing failures and etc. Uh, but ginger and turmeric, ma'am, uh, are much safer in Meghalaya now. Uh, <laughs> they are doing well, very well. Actually, ginger, I think we are producing a lot. Yeah. And turmeric also has taken off big time. And uh, thanks to Mr. Kane Kumar is the person who was uh, there. And I think uh, they've done very well. Uh, uh, and uh, this is one curve I wanted to show. I have only one slide. So this is the only slide. Uh, I, this curve is called the curve of the long now. Mr. Brent, I think I saw in UC uh, Berkeley when I had gone for a conference briefly. This curve uh, always gives me a lot of clarity in what we are going to do. I'll just briefly explain the curve, then I'll tell what has happened because of that. These are things uh, which are, you know, overall broad parameters. But if you look at from top, fashion keeps changing very, very often. The time it goes is fast, very, very uh, inconsistent, and etc. Commerce is much slower, but has an impact on fashion, depending on how it goes. You have more money, more accessibility, and better fashion. Infrastructure, if you have, it is even slower. But if it goes, then it can impact commerce and fashion. Governance, it is, I think, uh, also even slower than how in infrastructure when you compare the Bangalore Metro, I think it's quite a thing to say about. <laughs> so then culture, it takes even more uh, time to move culture, but if it culture moves, everything goes up very, very fast. Nature, nature literally means global warming and etc. Uh, 20 years back, it's unimaginable to sit in a November uh, in Bangalore without a sweater anywhere. Now nature has moved, so you can see till fashion how it has impacted all of us. So. This is a very important curve because as you can draw for any organization, any purpose, and etc. When I was in a district as a collector, uh, I was in a district called Southwest Garo Hills in Meghalaya. The closest railway station is some 200 kilometers, closest airport is some 250 kilometers, uh, closest national highway is some 40, 50 kilometers, very far, very remote, uh, but much better than because it was a much more plain district with some hills. Uh, the success, what I mean, the failure. What was the initial problem was there were uh, uh, primary health centers, and of course, the institutional area is very low in number. So uh, then we thought, uh, what is the whole point behind it, and why it is low in number? And it was despicably low. And it did not be like around 50 percent, 47, 48 percent. So when we kind of made the same thing for the PHC primary health center. What is the purpose of the primary health center was much more forgotten. All the things which were done for a primary health center were addressing the top three things, not the purpose. Purpose is somewhere at the core of it. Purpose of health center is something else. Unless you touch the purpose, other things are not going to move. For example, we had around 30 sub-centers which were not conducting deliveries. Uh, we are not like a state like uh, Kerala where uh, deliveries are conducted only at a higher referral unit. But in Meghalaya, it has to be conducted at a sub-center because predominant 90% deliveries are uh, normal deliveries and uh, not cesarean section and safe deliveries. But only five, six were conducting deliveries. Other they are saying that, you know, we have electricity problem, water problem, that, this and etc. But we kept on checking only one thing. What is the immunization target? What is the delivery target? How many pregnant women are there? Are you following up? These are the same question. People, they themselves found solutions or they brought the problem to the table when we said, no, I, I need this electricity, someone is there, I, this is the person, if you can talk to him, we can solve it. Infrastructure got sorted out. Governance owns, you address the purpose of it. Above things get sorted out. But what happens is, uh, uh, you know, we try to, uh, many times what happens, things stop at the fashion level. Or things are planned at bottom level, but these fashion things are very giving quick results. 
you put a so three things are top addictions i am told in world i think we can have a dispute on that but three things heroin carbohydrates and salaries three things <laughs> you know on this uh, thing they give quick results human mentality is like that if you start posting things on media and quick success stories they are addictive and you are looking only after quick stories you need to keep the entire thing for philanthropists for foundations who are there here uh, i have told i think uh, i think kartik and other things half a dozen times i have told them do not go into this publicity mode it will kill our purpose will lose the purpose until our purpose gives the outcomes which we want then automatically they will become a fashion statement which has uh, in meghalaya we have done few success stories and it has become like that but that has to be very very uh, careful so the investments also has to be proportional inversely so 60 to 80 percent has to go to the purpose or the you know capacity building or change in governance uh, we went to kerala uh, to study the panchayat model vijayanand sir is here rajiv sir is here i think it, it it has created a whole different paradigm change in the panchayat model what has been invested so long and there are institutional support which i think uh, uh, vijayanand sir also mentioned about in the shallow roots that there was no institution to carry on urban which i also urban was one of the projects in my district also sir so i can very well relate to uh, <laughs> that uh, but in kerala if you can see that it has been invested in governance and it has become a culture there from there if you do any small change so the impact will be tremendous it's going to be exponential in each uh, layer so that's something i wanted to uh, leave as a thought and only this uh, uh, approach in terms of always checking with the purpose what is the purpose of the funding what is the purpose of uh, you know doing it for example in meghalaya we are saturating the solar uh, that's how we got come to know with uh, silco foundation we are saturating all the centers with uh, you know solar powered at least the sub centers and then the phcs also where we have a, a solar powered uh, you know uh, facility with electricity for the anm residents and a vaccine carrier and few other equipments which energy efficient equipments within that system but that will be only an infrastructure it has to be a part of the governance as well as the culture unless it is going to percolate and systemize and stabilize that will not have the impact what we would like to have we are working on it but we are very aware of what uh, this has to do i think many partners are there across uh, uh, the world who are also looking into the same matter but this is quite important unless we are touch that uh, the impacts are not going to be exponential uh, nor uh, sustainable so i think uh, yeah that's the uh, few things i had to say uh, thanks for the opportunity again thank you very much sir kumar uh, can i have uh, anjal to come in okay before i move to my presentation i have a small anecdote to, to share uh, i have signed up to a panel uh, saying that i will say no to all the panels which are manals right which is all male so when usha was missing for some time in between because i've taught told huda that i am not going to be in the panel which is all male she said no no there's one person who is going to hold the flag for you but when usha was missing for 5 minutes my heart started beating uh, because if you know i have been a twitter campaign where it against all manals and so thankfully uh, this is and just a small uh, <laughs> Another point is also, you know, when I was uh, going to organize a workshop uh, in Bihar, uh, in Patna, I was working with the irrigation department there, and I, uh, you know, when I told them that send me a list of speakers, he sent me all male, male speakers, and I told them, no, no, I we cannot have this uh, uh, all male panels. Let's have some female uh, you know, uh, professionals as well. He said, don't worry, sir, we have many secretaries. They'll come and sit on the dais. so this is how uh, you know the tokenism also work uh, so uh, true spirit of um, uh, of gender inclusion uh, my earlier speakers have talked about just uh, reforming that may can i have my presentation on so i'm going to take this uh, 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 a, a very personal story to share and all the disclaimers apply that i'm uh, this is my personal story and this my side of story uh, i'm been part of ipcc the international uh, the climate uh, science climate body uh, and uh, uh, i'm under oath uh, of secrecy so i can't reveal many of the negotiation that has happened so i'm going to take out from from uh, you know the discussions here at uh, india level or at the country level and tell you what happens in the uh, what we call the international negotiations in, especially in the climate and we just finished uh, climate negotiations um, cop 27 um, 
and the outcomes have been a mix, uh, people uh, have been telling us, but I think I've been very happy with what has happened there. Uh, so under secrecy, uh, I'm going to not reveal the um, uh, um, nuances of what discussions happened, but a personal story of a failure which I want to um, uh, share here. Uh, the, uh, the question is, does good science lead to good Polit uh, good policies and this science policy domain is something that I want you all to uh, focus upon. So uh, in 2017 uh, actually I was uh, working with EC Mode International Center for Integrated Mountain Development in Kathmandu and I have been uh, nominated to uh, be uh, the, you know, between the fifth assessment report and the sixth assessment report which has come out now, uh, there was three special report which IPCC has commissioned. The first report was uh, 1.5 degree global warming and the second was on what we call the the SROC report. This is a system, it, uh, the report which actually looked at two interconnected systems, the oceans and the cryosphere system, and uh, uh, what has been, uh, what has happened. So like so slightly more zoomed in into what happens to our glaciers, what happens to our oceans, what is the interconnected in that sense. So that's the second report I was part of. The third report was on land uh, resources, which is also there. So I have been nominated, uh, and IPCC nomination process is huge. Uh, all the countries, 192 countries, uh, they send their uh, uh, scientists nominated uh, to IPCC board and this they speaks, uh, they get thousands of applications and they have to based on the publication record and the other records, um, uh, they, they have they're selected, uh, scientists are selected. So it's a very cumbersome process uh, um, and uh, thankfully I was there uh, as uh, coordinating lead author uh, for uh, the chapter, one of the chapters of the report. So uh, I'm just going to tell you because time is very short. What happened is that uh, the report uh, gets, uh, you know, uh, the the whole process of report is about two years. Uh, I was appointed in 2017 and the report was defended in Monaco in 2019. Uh, now between that time, we uh, all the uh, negotiations happened between the authors first, because first we have to get the literature, it's all based on the secondary information that we get, and mostly peer-reviewed journal articles, and then we have to get this, uh, this together. Uh, so that is the uh, thing, and then you have to defend this in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the plenary, where the 192 countries represent with their people, where you know, the kind of representation comes. Uh, and that is the summary for policymakers. And uh, um, so I have been part of this whole process. What has happened is that this report uh, brought in some very crucial factors, which was a landing uh, uh, you know, process of the, f of the report. That means the end of the report uh, about uh, the SPM was about 26, 27 pages long. And in the plenary, what happened is that you have each line by line approval by the country's representative. So every line is read, uh, discussed, negotiated. And whenever the countries do not uh, agree on certain wordings, they are sent into hurdle. So you go outside, the writers of the report will talk to uh, the negotiators and then there the entire uh, gamut happens. Now we had, uh, um, you know, a couple of, uh, we, we know that a couple of countries who do not like us to go green, uh, the other, these other people will definitely, they, we call them climate mercenaries. They hire the best of the talent from the world. Uh, these are the countries who are uh, you know, when you fly to US, you'll stop over there, one of those countries. I will not name them under secrecy uh, oath that I would not have to name, but you, it's very obvious. So what they do is that they hire the best of the professionals and they read the report much more than the authors have read it. So they'll go each by line and they, the, the, the whole strategy for them is to kill the report so that it doesn't come out. And uh, the IPCC negotiations are what we call the negotiation base. That means every country has to approve. If they don't approve, the report doesn't come out in public. So we were at the last end, uh, you know, it was a five day program. On the half of the program, like the fifth, th third day, we had not even approved 20% of our uh, of our report. So imagine what they do is that they will strategize it, they'll keep on asking questions, questions and questions so that you delay the report. When you have the final version, like last one day when you're really in a hurry to finish the report, they will get your negotiation right. So that's the strategy that these guys bring in. We knew this thing, we have been briefed internally, the scientists are briefed how this happens. So I'm just going to tell you what happened in the last portion. So there was a program in this report where um, uh, uh, they, there was a, a kind of a last portion of the report which was a landing point and we wanted the countries to go green. That means you have to decarbonize. The countries have to decarbonize. If the IPCC report uh, is passed, 
then the COP negotiations are based on IPCC report. That means whatever is written in this one becomes a wording for COP negotiations, and that means the baseline for them. So the countries the, who do not like the oil-rich countries, who would not like us to go green, they wanted to object on this point. So I had a voluminous uh, literature which was actually proving, uh, saying that uh, these, uh, you know, if you don't take the green path, you're going to have problem by 2050, 2030, and all this sort of part of things. These guys said no, and it was Friday night. We had an overnight session. Uh, so last two days, we have not slept for, for two nights, and early morning at 4 o'clock, the last point, these guys have said that, okay, fine, let's go to huddle and try and finalize how this is going to be, uh, this negotiation going to go uh, end. We went into huddle. We, we had about 20, 25 people, and I started uh, bringing all the literature that I had so that we can negotiate with them. The guy sitting there, he just took me out, said, dude, this is not science, this is politics. <laughs> so now the science end, the politics starts. We are not going to agree on this one. It's up to you that you want to have the report out or you don't want to have the report out. That's all, period. Then I understood that point that, okay, now uh, the science and the politics that is taught in the class, what I was teaching to my students, doesn't hold much ground when it comes to negotiation at the very high level. So uh, we went into, we, 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 we talked to our fellow scientists and we said, what happens? And there were no pressure on us. Our co-chairs had said, here, and Deborah Robert, who she is from Africa, and she told me, Angel, uh, it's up to you. It's two, uh, two years of work. 190 scientists have worked on it. You have worked on day in and day out. You want this small paragraph to be out so that the report is out, so that whatever the remaining report brings in for the rest of the uh, world, or you want to stop it here. And I said, I don't want to hold this. Let's just delete those two paragraphs, which was not agreeable by two countries, and we just finished it out. So on Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, we have not slept for two nights. We passed this report, it's called SROC report, Special Report on Oceans and Cryosphere. So, did I fail or did I pass? That's the whole part of it. It was personally, I felt that it was a personal failure. The tears started coming out of my eyes as the report was uh, released uh, in, the, in the international forum uh, because I thought that's a personal failure because I worked very hard. It was against, you know, all the reports, uh, you know, meetings happens late in the evening from 7 o'clock till 12 o'clock night because you have to talk to your Caribbean partners, you have to talk to your European partners, South America, North America, that kind of stuff. So you have to spend a lot of time for two years continuously and when you work on these things, you land up that the entire work that you have done has been deleted, and also the Global South are the losers. So my last point is what are the learning that we have? First thing is that good science may not be good politics. So, you know, there's so much of us academicians, we think that we have worked very hard, but it may not lead to having a good politics, and if it is not good politics, it may not turn out to be good policies as well. So we must take politics into account as we are providing strong scientific reasoning or experiment that we are having. The second part is as we are talking climate change since morning, the issues are as much as the issue of what we call the science, but it's also guided by a political system. You see what has happened in COP27, uh, it's the politics that takes over the science. So how do we work that? The last point I want to bring out here is that scientists must not overlook politics of the day. I think you have to work along with the politics Thank you so much for time. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, obviously, public policy is the toughest nut to crack. I mean, uh, th that seems to be very obvious. Uh, one, uh, I mean, one, one of the things that is difficult in public policy or in this space is how do you define anything as a success or a failure? I mean, it's obviously beyond binaries because uh, uh, while Usha was talking, she said SAG movement uh, uh, failed, you know, uh, th th through the passing reference, uh, she did mention that. There's a widespread belief that currently SAG movement is not exactly what it intended to be, but did it succeed in having made the impact? I mean, now what it is, is not a different, uh, is a completely different story, but did it make an impact? I mean, that's the that's question that we need to ask. So therefore, how do we define failure or how, we, how do we define success? I have two small um, instances. 
you know, uh, Amul is supposed to be a success. And then, therefore, we said, okay, let's replicate it across the country, the Anand Patan cooperatives, etc., etc., etc. It was replicated all across the country. What was replicated? The design was replicated that there will be a cooperative at the village level, that uh, there will be a processing unit at the district level, there will be a state marketing federation, was replicated. Was the democratic principle in which Amul, the original Amul work replicated? Not necessarily. So, uh, is Amul a success? Uh, yes. Is Amul's replication a success? Well, we don't know. Uh, the National Rural Livelihoods Mission, you know, when we look at it, that was one of the programs which was extremely successful at the first phase level, at the district level uh, in Andhra Pradesh when they started off as a pilot project. Obviously, pilot was successful uh, essentially because it had everything that could happen in public policy, which is customization, relevance to the local, this thing, because it was planned at the district level. The moment it was raised to the national level, then it was the Andhra model that was replicated in Bihar, Orissa, and so on. Is it contextually as effective is a question that we need to ask. I mean, in some places it is, some places it is not. So that's why it is very, very complex. And the third is what Anjal brought in, is what we think, or academics think, is scientifically correct is not necessarily going to work in the real world. Uh, you know, I, I remember, again, closed door conversation, we had uh, Mr. Chidambaram uh, come for the IMA convocation once and we had an interaction with him and we said, uh, you know, one of our faculty members went off on economist, went off on fertilizer subsidy, this, that and all. And Chidambaram said, uh, look, uh, you think I don't understand this? Uh, I have a cabinet and there are interests that this cabinet has and there are implications beyond what your equation tells me in terms of how it resonates with people, how do we communicate it to people. For example, on the loan waiver, I remember uh, Yashwant had set up a committee. Uh, we said we should not do it. He said it just doesn't, you know, you, you and we said we'll, let's do a nuanced waiver. He said how do you announce a nuanced waiver? How do you announce it to the country that we are doing a loan waiver but you are not eligible, he is not eligible, that is not eligible, six point font. You can't. So that's why it is complex. And then uh, I'll sort of take off from innovation and again go, going back to Usha. I remember one of the microfinance uh, leaders went to Usha and said we need to be re re regulated and Usha said please don't come to me for regulation during early days. Because innovation is breaking the rule. Regulation is setting the rule. Right? The moment you're innovating, you're breaking some existing norm or rule, you go back to the regulator and say, regulate me. The regulator will say, look, if I regulate you, you can't innovate. She said, look, I can understand what you're doing. My DGM will not understand what you're doing. So uh, there is a time for us to regulate. The final thing is we are all uh, very uh, wise in hindsight. How do we get the hindsight as we are doing it? You know, because as academicians, we always go back and say, ah, this was not the right timing, that was not the right timing. But uh, you never get the timing right because you don't know what's going to happen. In fact, I remember uh, in Canada, one of uh, very upcoming, uh, uh, you know, critics uh, was seen as a very promising academic. And now when we look back, uh, one, of the, one of my friends said he had a very bright future behind him. So it's almost like that. Uh, but anyway, so there are some questions that have come in. And uh, we have four minutes, uh, and Vijayanand has a, a hard stop. So, and I think all of us have a hard stop. Uh, ultimately, we all are here for lunch. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we can't fail on lunch at, at least. So, uh, one of the things, one of the questions that has come up, Vijayanand, is uh, what extent is the binary of rural-urban necessary at all? Why do we need to, you know, sort of even talk about this binary? I mean, going by that presentation, it's really not required. And the classic example is Kerala, which naturally grew. I don't think anybody developed it. So you can have a continuum. And uh, the continuum moves away from the urban into the rural, not reverse. I think it's very much doable. But not answering a question, this policy, SSGs before, after, if you look after, they, it's an improvement. And certain policy, I, I'll leave it that there was not a question. Narega, lot of you may say the crows of, lacks of crows will not be justified economically. But I can tell you, Narega is one scheme, probably the only scheme, which had the outcome without perhaps the output. So uh, there's one interesting question uh, uh, to you, Anjal. Uh, you spoke of overnight negotiations at COP, and uh, how much of the failure is attributed to overworked uh, 
participants and uh, not to <laughs> politics. No, abs uh, yeah, I mean, see, this is the, I was telling that this is the strategy is that the, some countries who don't want us to go green will adopt that, you know, by third or fourth day also, your 75% tech still there to approve. And that means you have to go into overnight sessions, and that means when you're fatigued, you're tired, and these guys, they strategize so well, they will, they will map out everything, they'll first, uh, you know, the moment the date is started, they will book a best of the hotel close to the venue so that they have come in, you know, batches. They're all slept very well, they will be coming, and I have not slept for two days. So you can imagine, uh, the, and this is a strategy they, do, they, they beautifully do it, and we should learn from them how to kill a report uh, when you work for two years. So that's the uh, thing. But I also like to you know, mention um, one more point is about the Global South and versus Global North divide. In terms of, the one is that about gender divide. Uh, when I started working, I was part of the gender task force of IPCC. We improved in the seventh or sixth assessment report, 40% of, of women scientists were, uh, were actually put in. Each of the uh, management committee, there were at least one woman in the things because that's one. So I think that's also important for inclusiveness as well as uh, because outcomes depends a lot on the internal negotiation that happens within scientists. Yeah. Sure. No, just <laughs> going back, there's one thing that I feel the self-help groups, because I've actually interacted with a lot of them at the ground level. They were a hugely empowering instrument. In fact, so much so that the first group with whom I interacted, so just on the outskirts of Hyderabad, the, they were doing these exchange programs and a group of uh, women from Andhra were taken to Uttar Pradesh because in Uttar Pradesh they wanted to replicate it. And the first, and this was a, a Muslim group, and the first thing they discussed in UP was, how do you do family planning? It was nothing to do with savings and loans. And just the women coming together and exchanging their own uh, you know, uh, experiences is hugely empowering. And I've seen this empowering happen again and again and again. And I think they have today become totally able to deal with the formal financial system. They're able to deal with technology and they're really on top of it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, to just conclude, uh, putting a binary between private sector and uh, public sector, private sector is neat. Uh, you know, uh, there might be a tobacco company which says that uh, we do a triple bottom line reporting. Just ask them uh, to say that, sorry, we were doing two other bottom lines and we compromised on the profits uh, for a quarter and just see what happens, the bloodbath that happens. So therefore, it's very clear what their output, outcome, uh, measurement, matrix, etc. is. Uh, you go back to the public arena and say we have triple, triple bottom line or four bottom lines. Uh, if you say I'm successful in two, the third one is always questioned. If you say, okay, I've achieved that, then you come back to the first one. So therefore, it is a messy thing and public policy related thing is more failure than success uh, because uh, it is subject to much more scrutiny and much more accountability on multiple firms, uh, multiple front, uh, uh, fronts. So therefore, it might be a good idea to celebrate uh, success uh, in the public policy failure rather than uh, go to the confession box. So sorry, Harish, uh, we are not there. Thank you. Thank you very much.